think we're there. Yep, we're live. Good morning, everybody. Um, this morning, I've chosen to draw um, a little piece of fur texture, one of the really popular ones from my workshop. Um, and I'm just going to pass the reference under. So it's a little piece of fur um, from behind the fox's neck. So his ear is in this area. And this is sort of his rough. And I like this bit because it's got the lighter fine hairs on top um, combined with some of the darker folds. So you can really get a sense of depth to the fur rather than it just looking like a lot of lines on top. And it's nice and bright too. And I like working in sort of oranges and reds. And they're rather gorgeous. Okay, so I'm working on pastel mat. This is um, dark grey pastel mat. It's a really neutral, it's really useful for animal art, it's a really neutral colour, it doesn't really add, other, other than being a little dull, it doesn't really add anything to the work you put on top, it's not got a strong yellow, blue or red bias, it's just pretty pretty neutral there, um, So and it also it tones in beautifully with the animal work as well. I think if I'm going to cover the paper completely and not have a white background, um, then this is the colour that I would use. It just um, it doesn't really fight with anything else. I'm not. I don't notice my colours really changing with it, which I might do if I was you know if I was putting yellow over a blue background or something. You're going to get a little bit of green tinge to start with at least. So I have selected my colours to go with my um, lovely orange fox fur. I've just gone through and done a range. These are all polychromous pencils. I've done a range of sort of going from ivory all the way to dark sepia, which is a really dark brown. So a variety of different um, oranges and russety and browns. And I like to make a little colour card as I'm going. It just gives me a really quick visual as to what I've got because obviously um, things don't all always look... Polys aren't too bad, actually. Polys do are reasonably accurate but they don't always look exactly the same and it saves me having to fiddle around and go backwards and forwards once I actually start drawing so it takes a little bit more time to set up but once you've done it it does save time in the long run it helps your creative flow because you don't have to keep stopping and starting okay so pastel mat for those who haven't used it is a, is a unique surface of Claire Fontaine and it's very lightly textured it all doesn't feel rough it's not like a sanded paper but you can feel a little bit of texture and it takes an awful lot of layers it was designed originally for um, pastel work obviously but has been adopted by a lot of um, colored pencil work so effectively and it allows a huge amount of layering which is ideal when you're working with animal fur okay so I will start now with the actual drawing I'm waffling on to um, just make sure it's all pressed. I've put mark. Just this is just literally a low tack masking tape around the edge of my um, little piece of pastel mat. It's about I think about four and a half inches square. And these excellent um, little exercises if you're new to pastel, new to and pencils, and you just want to get a hang of how they work and the layering process and the results you can get. These are an absolutely excellent way of doing so without spending a huge amount of time. So, looking at my um, reference, first off, as I really want to establish, there isn't a lot of shape, I suppose it is just literally a square of hair, um, but I want to start to establish the folds. So I'm going to take a darker brown, which I'm using here, um, all the pencils for this particular um, drawing are poly Faber-Castell polychromous, and this one's a burnt umber. So all I'm going to do with this first layer, <coughs> excuse me, I had to cough, is look at my reference. I'm just going to start to establish the darker areas. So normally, if you're using a smoother paper with a coloured pencil, then normal sort of practice is to work li um, light to dark. So if you want anything light, you need to preserve those lights. Then you add the dark as you go. So I'm just using a very light layer. But with pastel mat, sorry, I didn't finish what I was saying there. With pastel mat, you can put your lights on top of your darks, especially with this darker grey colour. So I'm just thinking about where is this? this is like the base of his ear. 
very very light um, pencil pressure so if I want the area darker rather than pressing harder at this stage I am just going to keep layering so just adding more and more pigment think of the paper as having like little peaks and troughs hills and valleys and the pigment is sitting inside those little troughs so the more I um, apply my pencil to the surface the more pigment comes from the end of the pencil and pops itself onto the paper it sounds really obvious but sometimes it's not so thinking coming around here and you see how lightly that first layer is you're really not applying a huge amount of pressure and just building so I'm not being hugely accurate with the placing and this is the really dark shadow so I'm just going to establish that and the first sort of is going to be flowing out over the um, rest of the fur so the fur here is pretty short and as it comes down the neck it's getting longer so just um, drawing that out Another good thing about these doing these little exercises is that it doesn't matter you know your placement doesn't matter too much you can really just focus on understanding how the pencils work because once you get your head around how they work best how you can layer them which colors cover better um, you'll find it will free you up a lot in your creativity rather than starting with trying to produce something really complicated just do a few exercises if you're new to doing this and even if you've been doing it for a while these sort of things are really good fun I really love doing these little studies it really allows me just to relax and enjoy it rather than worrying about the end result so if things don't go right with something like this it's a it's purely a learning exercise it's purely about you um, exploring and experimenting and these are the ideal times to think okay so what happens if I add this next and what happens if I use this blender or whatever rather than worrying and trying to get it perfect all the time so just building and there's a the hair is growing from down here and then from left to right here so you find a bit of a crease appearing So at the moment it doesn't look like anything but it will by the time I finish drawing I promise you it definitely will and feel free to ask any questions as we go you can type them in the comments box if you need to happy to answer them you can always um, pop it in there afterwards as well I should pick that up too there we go building slowly and I'm just um, paying attention to the direction of hair growth I'm not you know the layers I'm putting down there one won't show as fur texture as such but I'm just noticing where the hair is so I'm not putting lines that are gonna contradict um, what I'm doing and there's another little darker bit there so already I've sort of gone quite off what the actual original is but that doesn't really matter it's just practice of the actual texture is the important thing okay so that's my burnt umber layer for this one and then I'm going to go to the darkest color I'm using which is the dark sepia a nice really neutral brown and I want to just put in the darker points so in if you look here on the reference again shadow here there's one coming down here just around the folds here these are all the little areas I want to bring some depth to again noticing the way the hair grows it's out from the center you can see this has got a lot more pigment this is a much stronger um, color and that's another thing you know each pencil is slightly different um, some pigments are more opaque some are more um, translucent and you'll work out which pencils of yours whatever brand you use you don't have to use polys um, which pencils will cover more readily which pencils more apply a little wash of color 
and it's really just getting to know your tools it's um oops <laughs> blow a little bit of pencil away in it and we went a bit wrong just darkening in the center So you see I'm not covering the whole of what I put down before with this, I'm just sort of going into the middle areas and then you get a graduation of colour between the different pencil colours. I think one of the things that um, I've been teaching people have struggled with is avoiding to get, avoiding getting really hard lines between the different colours and that can look quite unnatural if you're aiming for realistic animal art. You want there to be a flow um, between the colours, and just up here, just putting it in the centre. And so you really don't need to be 100% accurate about placement. It's just about working out how the layering works with pencil, and how the how you blend by layering as well. It'd be quite a shock to some people that they don't sort of blend in the way that pastel will blend. You don't physically push them together. Um, it's more because they are translucent, because they don't cover completely what's underneath. Um, you can blend and get some gorgeous, rich, deep colours. And of course, it's a slow process, but I like that. <laughs> Added. And I'll come back in and darken certain areas as I go, but I just want to, and I'm just checking back to my reference where, you know, just a quick glance can sometimes be really helpful because it's like, where are the real dark points? The darkest points are here. There's a little line of dark shadow here. And a couple of little spots over here, just where the hair parts. A little bit up there. Good so far so next step I'm going to use um, burnt sienna this is a lovely um, rich ready brown which I use a lot with my animal work so this is where I'm going to start to cover a bit more of the paper I'm going to start thinking a, really a little bit more about where um, how the hair is growing um, the length of the hair and start to build up some of the darker areas so I'm looking now at these sorts of areas around here that's I'm going to start to build up extending out from the shadows that I've put in and all this area is where what I'm going to be thinking of next let's see all these areas around here so it's quite a big layer this one Oops. I'm trying to put my hand in front of the camera it's a lovely warm so you're going to sort of almost obliterate some of the work you've done before which can feel like you've um wasted your time but you really haven't it's all about building these gorgeous gorgeous rich rich colors i think you know referring back to pastel those who have worked with pastel because obviously it's sort of been prominent in the art world a lot longer is that with pencil once you put a layer down it's pretty fixed with pastel the more layers you put on, you're, you're, you're physically changing and moving around those previous layers. Whereas with pencil, it's, it's fixed. It's there, unless you use some a solvent or a blender or something that essentially changes the nature of the pencil. Solvents work by basically dissolving the binder. So any, any paint or, or pencil, you have your pigments and then you have your binders and with different mediums they're different so watercolor it's gum arabic and water acrylic you've got an acrylic binder oils they use oils obviously <laughs> but the pigments essentially are the same so just building out the color and i'm working quite quickly with the pencil if you notice um i started with a relatively sharp point and very quickly it will blunt on this paper so every few um, pencil strokes, I'm just turning the pencil slightly and it just keeps a sharp edge against the paper. So you're not continually 
sharpening and putting all of your expensive pencils into your sharpener pot. Again, this is a richer here. So I'm building that colour. And also, for my actually the way I use the pencil, um, I'm not just scrubbing backwards and forwards, just putting pigment down on the downstroke. That's, and when I'm doing fur, that seems to work. If I go backwards and forwards, it can be a bit, I, I don't feel it, I can control it as easily and get such a nice, smooth sort of effect. How long have I been doing this? Ah. Well, I've been drawing forever since I was very small. Um, coloured pencil, obviously as a kid we all use coloured pencils without really taking them very seriously. And I've worked throughout the years in graphite, watercolour, pastel, all the normal sorts of mediums. I've actually been using coloured pencil seriously since about, I think 2015, 2016. Um, and actually, I really clicked with it. I found... Um, I like working slowly, I that's why I love my graphite work and I love the control I have with graphite, I love you know paying attention to values and really creating detail and I couldn't quite capture in my paint and pastel work the same feel that I used to get in my graphite work, it just didn't quite work for me. Um, and then say so I discovered coloured pencil, I saw an artist posting their work on um, Facebook and I thought ah that looks interesting did a little bit of research obviously even though it was only five years ago there was wasn't there's a couple of really good books the colour pencil bible was the one I got um, but there wasn't the wealth of information there is today there's huge amounts now and that's just in five years so it's um it's come on in leaps and bounds and is really starting to be taken seriously as a medium. Yes, so basically about five years and it actually encouraged me to, you know, I have worked as an artist in varying degrees of commitment over the years and I hadn't been and it actually encouraged me to get back to my artistic roots. Such was my enjoyment of working this way. Sorry, my um, scrolling bar. Um, did I attend Vince's classes? No, I'm not sure who Vince is. <laughs> um, do I belong to coloured any coloured pencil groups? No, I don't. I belong to the um, UK Colour Pencil Society, but I don't actually attend any local groups. Local to me, I'm sure I think you mean. Sienna down so this is going to start to bring the effect of hair texture and this is a much redder area there so I'm just going to put a bit more in just try to get my hands out of the way of the camera doesn't affect the focus too much direction of travel travel growth rather <laughs> get about something else there
done quite a lot without needing to sharpen by the fact that I keep turning and the pencil you know you almost think that was quite blunt but actually there's still quite a sharp edge to use against the paper so it does make it more cost effective if you're always wanting that perfect long point you're going to spend a lot of money on pencils <laughs> So I notice as I'm drawing the head, oops, losing my reference and my things come untacked. Noting the length of the hairs as well. So this area, it's got much longer hairs. So I start to draw those out over the clear areas. Just noticing the way the hair lies. Still early days. Again, the fur's a little shorter in this corner, so I'm just going to make these little strokes a little bit shorter. So you're going to have a lot more chance to address this as we go. There is a little imperfection, didn't notice that one, I put it out. And a little bit of the pastel matte texture has come off. So it's just a test piece, so I'm not worried. They basically make pastel mat, I think it's a cellulose, um, and they make it by spraying the texture onto card, on thick paper. And um, sometimes little bits get missed. They're very good though if you do find anything that's alright, they will replace it. But just need to double check before you actually go ahead and start your masterpieces you haven't got a missing bit but you can normally manage to fill it quite effectively so you don't really notice it okay that's your burnt sienna layer so basically um sort of established the shape and the value of the fur values i mean the lights and darks and also um just started to bring a little bit of texture now next step is i want to really add some color and i also want to start to fill that tooth a little bit because you need to have several layers on pastel mat before you can really get those fine details if you notice you can still see the texture of the paper coming through um, and actually by the end of it i want it to look really smooth so you can't see that so for the next step get my um, burnt ochre and these are all Faber Castell polychromous and that is probably the you know they're not cheap nothing of a good quality in the art world is cheap or anywhere really but if you're gonna buy them and y if you're gonna buy pencils these are probably the ones I would recommend to start with they are the most affordable of the professional quality ranges it's a really good range of color they're very easy to get hold of and you can buy them in sets or you can get them open stock. And they're just a really good. And then you can add to them, you know, um, I started by buying, basically didn't even buy a full step to start with. I bought open stock and I went through and selected all the animal -y colors that they did. Said so all the grays and all the browns and some oranges. A little bit of green and blue, some primaries in there as well, but I didn't buy the full set to start with. So I didn't really want to spend over £100 in one hit on some pencils when I wasn't quite sure if they were going to work for me. Um, and once I used them, I thought, no, got to have the whole lot, and then bought a full set, and then I've bought several more full sets and lots more open stocks, and <laughs> now I have a very large pencil range. I also use... Um, Karen Dash Luminance and Karen Dash Pablo. They're really nice brands as well. Pablos are probably more similar to the 
polys in feel for when you're working a little bit softer possibly and the luminance um, have a slightly more sort of creamy waxy feel and they've got a, I really like their pale colors They they work brilliantly with polys for this layer you can see I'm just putting literally putting a layer of color it's like a color wash if I had a paintbrush it would be a really liquid wash of color and it just brings it all together so I'm still going in the direction of growth I'm still just turning to my pencil but I'm just I'm also noticing I want even coverage so I'm noticing if some areas get a little bit missed and some areas um, take a bit more pigment and I'm just trying to even that out so I might just apply a little bit more to areas where the pigment hasn't adhered quite so well. Yes there's a comment there about arches watercolour. The wood, I mean I've used um, smooth papers and watercolour papers before and they work pretty well you know they're artists it really does depend on your drawing style um, artists who don't use so many layers or don't don't need to um, then they work brilliantly I think I very naturally just want to put a lot of layers down so I find pastel mat works um, particularly well from that I'm not fighting my natural tendencies it's papers working with me rather than against me let's say the rule is there are no rules just suggestions <laughs> see how much it's you know I haven't actually physically blended anything but they're already starting to look more sort of harmonious do I go from light to dark on pasta mat no is this short answer <laughs> it really depends on if I want pure white but if the subject I'm doing has a lot of pure white in it so I'm doing um, then I will most likely work start on a white paper and I will try not to I won't expose more clearly I won't expect to put a lot of dark color down and then get a pure white on top of it you can do like white whiskers and things on top of darker colors but the more you you want to be careful that you don't overfill the tooth as long as there's plenty of tooth you'll be able to get your whites on top of your darks let's say if you really want pure white then preserve the, that white don't actually put any other color underneath it and I will um, do some exercises with white fur and dark fur as well and whiskers I think that'll be a popular one <laughs> just to show how I personally do it there are many different ways of creating the effects we want Well, thank you, Megan. Yeah, no comment about working that they work much slower. Um, I think this is just down to experience. And I've always been a bit of a scribbler, although my work ends up looking very precise and no one believes me that I'm a scribbler. If I'm just drawing freehand, it's very, very scribbly. So I love the constraint of putting in the details, but I also just like to be able to jump around like I'm doing. Um, and not really have to worry about being too precise okay so we've got a much hopefully the colors are coming out on your screens but it's looking a lot more it's very rough and very crude doesn't really look like fur just like a square of color with some lines across it um, but it's starting to look more harmonious So I want to now, I want to really, you know, the first, burnt ochre was establishing that first layer of colour and now I want to, you know, you look at this, it's really vibrant and really red, really gorgeous colours. So I want to start to build some of those colours. So you're going to lose some of the shape that you've put in or appear to lose some of the shape you've put in, so don't worry about it at the moment. So, 
all the way away, Sanguine. This is a really sort of pinky um, orange and a really nice rich one. So I'm going to start to add again over the brighter areas another layer. Each layer you put down is just filling that tooth a bit more and you can just see the richness growing. And I just add the, the tape around the um, edges just to give it a nice clean line when you peel the tape off. There's no real reason other than that. You don't have to do that. I just like doing it because I like peeling it off at the end. <laughs> so the areas that are lightest, which are going to be get some lighter areas here around this area. I'm not going to put the sanguine across. Oops, doesn't want to prop up on my board at the moment. I'm just thinking about this one really making the areas richer. You can see it's sort of covering up those darks. You can see how effectively the light, the, you know, you can cover over by building the layers with pastel map. more pressure as I colour on top eventually when I get to the, the stage of um, putting details on and hair texture the real fine hairs then I would use more pressure At the moment it's still pretty light and I will do some exercises on here maybe over the weekend just to show you how to work with your pencil text pencil pressures they're always really useful it's very easy for me to say we'll just use light pressure but that could mean so many different things to different people so I can give you a couple of exercises to help you establish what light pressure really means and what firm pressure really means keeps changing at the moment. A gloomy old day out there again. So bringing that orange through the darker areas when sort of pinky gorgeous russety really a colour you'd associate with animals particularly but then when you blend it with others you're not using any of these colours in their pure form you're mixing and blending as you go and we mix our colours you know this is very far away from colouring in <laughs> so we're creating a whole palette and a whole range of colours um, but we create them, excuse me, on the paper rather than um, on a palette and then apply. That's looking a lot richer. I'm probably doing this maybe slightly quicker than I would do normally, just to give you the idea. you'll get enough of a clue if you're not sure about pencils. Oops. My low tack masking tape is very low tack. It doesn't want to stick to the board at the moment. <laughs> Never mind. The end of the world. So 
so still just drawing this um, burnt, si burnt sienna sanguine through the hairs and create starting to create that feeling of movement you can see it the value is still pretty strong here from the fold in the fur you can start to see it happening up in this right corner but it will get more and I find with pasta mat it's a lot more forgiving than the other papers um, if you if you overdo your values or you overdo your colors you can take them back relatively easily some of the other colors papers rather once you've applied a colour, that's it. You're sort of stuck with it. So I find with pastel mat, it is just a bit more generous. It lets you experiment a little bit more. It did take me a while to get used to it, though. Um, I must say, I was I think from my graphite days, I wanted a really, really smooth paper. So I was going through all the um, like Bristol boards and um, hot press watercolour papers, sort of Fabriano and Strathmore's, which are lovely, lovely papers. Uh, and I'm really happy with some of the stuff I produced on them but I just saw some I was just intrigued by pastel mat I saw some really be really really beautiful work being produced and got some and thought oh not sure about this because I wasn't basically layering enough so I was ending with a, a sort of a rough finish like you can see here um, and not realizing that I needed to just keep going that little bit more but I persevered and I think one day, I think I actually had it at an art market or something. I was doing a work, working there on my stall and something just clicked. I was like, oh right, I get this now. You can put all those details in, it just takes just a little bit more time. Um, but, it, but the payoff for it taking a little bit more time is that you get so much more flexibility. So I still want this to be much brighter and I also want to cover this paper more. So it'd be easy at this point to think, all right, okay, now I've got to start putting hairs in, little individual hairs, but it's still way too soon. They'll end up looking a bit sort of rough and ready. So um, back to the terracotta, which is another um, lovely orangey colour. Oh, question there, how do you erase on pastel mat? I don't really <laughs> and that's not because I never make a mistake but if as long as you're lay as long as you're light you just go over it um, if I ever really need to take anything off something say I've gone really dark in an area then um, you can use I can sometimes dab it off with a bit of putty rubber that will lift a little bit of pigment or you can use a bit of like um, magic tape so a little bit of low tack tape and I'll just do a little bit in the corner and if you just draw over it it just lifts pigment see so that if I had to I'll just fill that back in it's gonna maybe look a bit strange down no mind um that would be how I would do it but to also further add on with the erasing um my line draw I do all my line drawings and changing composition fiddling with the shape and everything on another piece of paper I don't draw directly onto the pastel mat freehand because if you want to make changes which because I say I'm a bit sketchy and scribbly when I draw every time you draw a line with with the graphite you're going to indent the paper which is um which isn't what you want because you'll have trouble filling it then if you want to indent that's fine that's another another technique for creating texture but if you don't it's really really annoying so I do my all my line drawings workings out change the composition blah 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 separate just cheap layout paper and then I um, use graphite trace down paper to apply the outlines to my pastel mat and that I've found is a cost effective way of doing it tape does work well yes and it's also the, the more um, pigment you have down the better it works but it's really it's a really good little 
little tip and technique to use that one you can also use it um, to create some textures as well have a little play see how that's starting to really look vibrant but it's you know I've used a lot of different colors but there's no rigid definition between the colors they're all starting to flow together look more harmonious you get that lovely lovely rusty effect and you can see as well you know um, I know a lot of people worry about choosing the right colors how you don't need to be don't worry about it too much just go roughly in the right ballpark um, and just play with it you, you know you're creating new colors working this way so it's not picking the perfect color out of the box that's going to be the be all and end all have a play with what you've got and if you get your form right if you get your um, values and your shape of your fur and texture right the, the actual colors your eye will read it as correct even if they're just a little bit off and we all see color very differently anyway so it's not something that you need to worry about and if you have limited funds and you can't afford a full set just get what you can afford and focus on your techniques and your form and your values okay so that's got my terracotta and then back to the burnt ochre I'm just going to sharpen that, it's just got a little bit far down. Oh, hello, Anne. Nice to sort of not quite see you, but <laughs> good to know you're there anyway. Right, so this, I'm just going to put another layer of blending across the top. So I'm using this time sort of an elliptical motion. And that's a real, if you want a real sort of smooth finish, that's a good way of doing it. Just keeping the pencil against the paper and using a small elliptical motion. It just creates a nice even surface. And you just find if some little troughs are a little bit deeper than others and the pencil doesn't want to go in them, just you can almost go vertically and pop a little bit of pigment in. The paper is starting to look more smooth and more filled. You can see there, I'm losing some of the graininess. So I'm going to shine my light a little bit. It's just dull outside. I do have other lights, obviously, but nice to have a bit of natural light as well but natural light seems to have disappeared <laughs> it's going to pour down any minute got far too used to all that nice weather we've been having so again just going over creating a nice smooth finish and there's also no one you know fixed method that's always going to work um, it is really about having a variety of different ideas about how much something might be produced and picking your best guess and going with it and then adjusting as you go. Do I use a blender or burnishing pen? Uh, I can't speak. Do I use a blender or burnishing pencil? No, not on pasta mat. No, you don't find, because you're using so many layers, you don't find it needs it. The, the layering itself will create a lovely smooth finish. Tend to, I will sometimes use something like that on smooth paper, but not on pastel mat. And actually, if you layer enough, you don't tend to need them. They tend to be, um, they're useful if you want to 
maybe you've got so I tend to use them I suppose if I've got small areas where I don't want a huge amount of layers because the colors pretty neutral don't need all this color going on underneath so I might use it if I'm if I say if I'm using a smoother paper but not so much on here such as filling in not sure how much they'll show on the video but they're just trying to make sure that coverage is really even Or is it like it's putting down very much but it's starting to come together it's starting to get a certain glow about it as well um, which is what I'm looking for we still need to go brighter to be the next step so I guess if I do have a method it's to establish my values and my shapes and forms first which I sort of did with the darker colors and then I like to get my colours down, so I like to wash with colour and um, get vibrant stuff down. And the final step is to put the details in. And with the colours, you're tending to go backwards and forwards between adding colour, re-establishing values, adding colour, re-establishing values. And you get to a point where you just need a few little tweaks with your details and it's all it all comes together. I say it's not set in stone. I do try and just trust my judgment um, about what it needs but I say I've had a lot of experience doing this so I've got more ideas about what might work so in the early stages you're just learning it's a good idea to follow a tutorial or something just to get to grips with it early with the basic techniques how it all comes together you get as well the you know the more you do this the more things you see but that looked pretty smooth around there to begin with and I've just come back to it and gone oh no that's actually still quite rough it's really starting to look smooth now I'm probably uh, just using a very slightly harder amount of pressure but still very light comparison to say writing pressure so that's a good way to think about it you think how much pressure you put when you write something lighter than that that's how I will do those exercises because they've always they're always really useful to do and do that organize myself and do that another morning And all of these videos, if you're just dropping in and need to disappear off somewhere else and you want to see the rest of it, it's all going to be both on my YouTube channel and also um, will still be up on my Facebook page. So it, don't panic, you won't miss out. Nearly, nearly. do I determine what pastel mat to colour to use? Um, I basically pretty much use either white if I want a white background or um, the subject is very pale so I'm not fighting the dark colours or I use so either white or I use this colour which is the dark grey and I tend to use the dark grey for I'm going to cover the background and for animal subjects because it's a really nice neutral colour and having a coloured paper you can put in your values, you can put in your lights and your darks and the paper adds as a mid-tone when you're sort of plotting your drawing. I will tend not to use the coloured ones because I rather, I much prefer actually creating my own coloured backgrounds. Um, like if you look on my page you'll see some examples with some very colourful backgrounds and that's all on the dark grey pastel mat. And I do that, I tend to use backgrounds with um, pan pastels, which work brilliantly as backgrounds alongside um, colour pencil. But I will do some info about pan pastels as well, because they are fab little additions to your arty toolkit. Okay, that's my burnt ochre. So still, it's orange, but it's still not as orange as I want it to be. So I'm going to add some really bright orange, so the cadmium. Here we go, what am I doing? What am I doing? Somebody help. <laughs> so, a little bit more. So 
So really, again, thinking about hair texture, really zinging it. So I'm not putting, this isn't hair texture yet, I'm not putting, I'm creating a vibrant base that the hair texture will go on. So don't worry that it's not looking furry yet. This is all about the base. A song about that, isn't there? <laughs> I want my base to be really singy. So you can use, I mean, some of the horses I've done recently, I'm using at Scarlet's and really, really vibrant oranges as bases in within my palette. So, so really get a vibrancy and saturation of colour. Would I do the pan pastel background after I have completed my subject? No. I do my backgrounds first. Before I start anything, I've usually... Um, and I've learned this the hard way. I've done an awful lot of planning in my head and I've pretty much drawn it in my head first. So I sort of know how it's going to look and how I or how I want it to look. It doesn't always turn out the way I want it to look. But I've got a really strong, you know, and I can sit on a photo or an image or a thought. Usually it starts as a thought of what I want to create and then I need to go and find the photos. So I'll, if I can manage to take them myself, I will. Um, so I've got a feel for what I want to create and then I just sit and think and think and think. I used to think I was procrastinating but I've sort of realised it's very much part of the process for me. It's to, it's to create, to allow my mind to create first and then once I um, sort of like can't wait to get to the drawing board I know I'm ready to really to go for it. It's, uh, so I do the backgrounds first because if I do if I do the subject first I'm doing it against a white paper so your colors and your values are going to look very different against white as they are against say my background purple or turquoise or something so I get those colors in I get that background colors in first and it also allows me not to have to worry about am I going to go over the edges and um, ruin all my hard work with the pencil by being a bit slap um, slap dash with the pastel and inadvertently covering pencil up it also allows if I'm doing something with very um, like a tiger or something and it's got long hairs that flick out over the background you're not worrying about drawing around them or having to um, reapply them afterwards you basically can put your pastel down the background down and then um, Sorry, I'm just concentrating on what I'm doing here. Think about other things and then I go off if I so I'm just getting some vibrancy in here. Just with my some more colours. Okay, and the last stage of this saturation is gonna be this is a light yellow ochre. This is another really useful colour. Just over the lighter colours. It's not seeing a huge amount, but it can just brighten. There's an area through here. That's nice to see so many of you watching. Thank you. Be a bit sad satire on my own. <laughs> but I'd still do it because I enjoy it and most of the time I sit here on my own drawing anyway, so I guess it wouldn't actually make any difference. <laughs> okay. Just thinking a little bit of hair textury here, but not hugely. Still want the flat. Starting to look quite lively. Light here, that's very annoying that bit of imperfection in the paper, but never mind. Should have paid a little bit more attention to the piece I was chopping up. 
So pastel mat as well, I quite often hear people saying how expensive it is, and it's certainly not a cheap paper, um, but the my, probably most cost effective way to buy it, and this is what I do, is to buy the very large sheets. So I don't want the full range of colours, I only want white or dark grey, so I buy the 50 by 70 centimetre sheets, um, and then I chop them up to the size I need. And you can also end up with some, you know, useful little scraps of things, so you can do your... Um, little colour charts if that's how you like to work and I know some people are so much more um, loose in their approach and it is about just applying stuff to the paper or the whatever and seeing and letting it work itself out that way and we're all different and however we create it's unique and that's what's wonderful about art and one of the things I love about demo workshops actually is how you're giving everybody the same reference same colour palette same line drawing, and everybody's work looks different because we're all putting a little bit of ourselves into what we do. It's not about creating carbon copies of what we're doing. It's about um, how do I see this particular image? What do I? What does? What about? What is it about this image that I really like and I want to show the world? really nice and bright now ah and pastel mat is reduced in the great art sale so get on there <laughs> if you're in the uk great art will quite often do some very good deals on pastel mat actually but generally say if you buy it in the large sheets it is um a lot more cost effective than the smaller pads and you can, you know, you can still buy your colours if you like your colours. I just tend to find myself going for the dark grey and the white. Okay, now I have some um, livelier fur. So, this, you know, if you want to do a more muted one, you just use a more muted palette. If you want to get really bright, then you do a lot more reds and things and real bright oranges. But I still want it to look natural and realistic. So I've sort of gone as accurately as possible. And actually, when you're choosing your colours, if you think about, you know, whether you've got your printed reference here or you've got your thing on a palette, on an iPad or a tablet or something. Um, what I've tended to do with all my colour ranges is to actually create a chart of the whole range. And then you can just lay the whole range against your colour and it just sort of, you can just see very easily um, if you're not sure whether it's blue you know warm colors cool colors it, you can really see which colors your pencil colors tone more with your reference and that will give you a starting point if you're not sure about what sort of colors to use and again as like I said before don't worry too much you're creating blends as you go um, it will all turn out I'm sure Yeah, Veronica, it will still be here, so don't worry, <laughs> I'm not going anywhere. Right, so now we're getting on to the bit that's really good fun. We're going to start now to start to think about actual fur texture. So I'm going back to my sort of middle brownie colour, the burnt sienna, the rich red brown. I'm just going to sharpen it. So we've got the brightness and now we want to put the values back in, so the darkness, so we're putting more depth back into it. I'll start in this area. So coming out of the dark area, I'm gonna go, so long strokes for long fur. Just noticing where it goes. It's going up there. You know, areas you want darker, just add more, just like we did in the beginning. Don't press harder yet. See how subtly it all starting to blend together. And these areas where it's shorter and fluffier, you can just use an elliptical to get a flat 
elliptical stroke to get a flat colour. That goes in there. You see by putting the darks in, or re-establishing those values, it brings the lights forward. So you don't always need to add more light colour. Sometimes if you're, it is more about, um, I think it would be quite, you can be quite nerve-wracking to go really dark if you're not used to it. Just about how's that hair going? Gosh, I've been here an hour already. My goodness, time is flying. I must be having fun. <laughs> You know, you look at your reference, where do you see the, where do you actually see individual hairs and where don't you? It's very easy with fur to get stuck into doing lots and lots of lines. Um, but some areas like here is just a bit softer. You're not really seeing individual hairs. So I'm just going to do a little circular motion just to get to get some colour down. And other areas, the hairs are more easy to see. Again, this is a nice fold and it gets quite dark in here. Let's see, this fur going in this way. And this is the bit I really enjoy, I think is starting to, it all starts to come to life. drawing sort of the negatives in so the dark places behind the light fur it's dark coming out there as well I keep putting my head in front of my own light which isn't good not with the sun not um, being out at the moment it's dark around the end here This is doing this relatively quickly. I probably would spend be a little bit slower um, if I wasn't doing it on video. But I just want to give you that general idea of how it works without taking up several hours. <laughs> that is the problem with coloured pencil when it comes to teaching because it does take a long time. It's very hard to do just quick little demos subjects anyway it's fine if you're just showing a technique but creating that texture around here needs to be and I'm looking at the shape so I'm looking at sort of like there's a shape there that I want to bring in and it gets thicker there and there's a sort of a oblongy triangle pointy thing there so rather than thinking of it as being just about lines and hairs, what shapes are you seeing in your work or in your, in your subject? So just building up, going into that fold. right in front of my face as it has to be it's just in the wrong place for me to see my reference photo <laughs> I've just ordered a longer arm so I can hoik it up a little bit get a little bit easier still at least we have the opportunity nowadays to do this sort of thing it certainly wouldn't have been possible that many years ago and there's so much fantastic stuff available at the moment. It's just really amazing. Also a bit overwhelming, I think, sometimes. It's knowing where to, where to look. So just the 
I wouldn't normally curl my hand around like that, but I just want to try and um, avoid the camera focusing on my hand too much. Keep it on the paper. So just putting in some hair. See, I'm not being hugely, hugely fussy. It's always just keep working at it. matter if you're a cheapskate there Valerie <laughs> as long as it works and you get the results you want it doesn't matter it's, um, if I could buy a cheaper paper I really would <laughs> dark it just blends all those colors together just want to go over that again dark zebra is a very sort of um, what's the word I want to say dull brown but it's it doesn't have it's not a particularly red or um, doesn't have much other color in it it is a very neutral brown which is really really useful um, often browns like have a lot of red in them or they can go the yellowy way and knowing the colour bias can really help but if you don't want to really blacken it then dark sepia is a good dark to use it's something I use quite a lot and I hear the hairs are longer. it's coming out of the rough and it's going into the coat so I'm just going to sort of alter it slightly certainly couldn't be someone who sat and did every single tiny little hair slowly slowly um, I think it would drive me nuts help me I'll develop this very sort of sketchy way of working that ends up looking detailed and smooth um, but I find just a lot easier to to work with And then I just film this and do a speed drawing. It looks like I work even faster. <laughs> okay. So that's added another layer of dark. So it's starting to get more depth. Starting to look a little bit hairy. But not quite there yet. Still got a way to go. So I'll go for the next tone down with my browns. Which is my um, burnt umber. Just going to sharpen that again. What pressure am I using with the brown strokes? Still pretty light, um, not as heavy as writing pressure, but not quite as light as I was in the very beginning. So I'm just going to be very light. When you have a very sharp point, you've got to be even lighter with your pressure. You just snap the thing off. So I'm looking to where my folds are and I'm just adding a bit more depth to those certain folds. See how it just again, the darker you go with your values, the more the lighter areas look light. It sounds really obvious when you say it, but it's just, you know, how our brains see it. Easy. you just got to how do I get it lighter how do I get it lighter and often with my um, like whiskers and things they look really white because I've just darkened the area around them very slightly not so you'd notice but it just makes the eye the um, whiskers pop a little bit more visually um, so it looks really pure white you know shining white but actually they're probably quite gray <laughs> it's just playing with values and understanding values 
putting some shadows in there. That's like the back of his ear around here. You can see how it's starting to look like it's got some depth to it. Like you could like stick your fingers in and give him a little neck scratch. Not that I'm sure most foxes would appreciate that. You might get nipped, but. I think this particular fox that I took this photo from, he was very, very dog-like. He was um, rescued. He's at the British Wildlife Centre. He was a rescue. Found him. Um, I think he'd basically had some trauma during birth and wasn't quite developmentally right, and that his mother had basically rejected him. But they rescued him, brought him back to health, and he basically was so dog-like. It was, you know, all of his expressions and mannerisms. And you can see how um, dogs came from wolves and how the domestication process happened. Not that a fox is a dog, but it was quite amazing to see. I'm just going to draw all that shadow out. Just also think about how the first sort of layers on top of each other, and you just want to draw some of those dark shadows through oh, it's a particularly dark area I'm just gonna darken a couple of little points around here okay I think with some of this that you know they think about the dark areas are going to recede visually and the lighter areas are going to come forward so if you want a certain area to disappear a little just make it a tone darker okay so I just want to further where's my dark sepia now again just gonna get that sharpened and just go up to I don't know if you can see. I'm dropping down, I take that up there, don't I? Really? <laughs> how much more smoothly? You know how many? See how many layers I put down? How much more smoothly this is going down? And you can't sort of force it. There's a point at which suddenly it all just seems to glide together. And now it's starting to lose its the tooth is disappearing visually, and you're getting just blowing the dust away a little bit more base of the ear here and then a little bit there just noticing where I'm not going to do it again over because this is very dark over all of the dark areas but just pop in little bits I think maybe the hairs might be particularly parted and again just through the center here it's a little bit down there maybe just a little and this is where as well you can evaluate your um, drawing completely separately from the reference so the reference is one way but it is just a tool it's it's a guide you don't have to slavishly copy every bit, but just evaluate, you know, do, do I need to put any darker areas in certain places or am I fine as I am? And again, just because something's in the reference doesn't mean you have to put it into your drawing. It's, um, we're not photocopiers. Okay, so I've got our folds in. Now I'm going to put the texture in. So this is going to look a little bit strange at the beginning, a little bit harsh, visually harsh. Let's so go to my ivory pencil. So I'm going to go across the areas we look like. Um, see the hairs 
on the long end of the hairs with the light sort of catching and there we don't really see much around here so I'm just going to very lightly pull out almost the highlights just little tiny bits of fur texture and it looks odd at the moment but there's a little extra extra thing to do next which will really help it but ivory works really well for this for some reason see something about that pigment that and note as well when you're drawing hairs don't just uniformly do them in parallel lines they invariably you know hairs taper as they get towards the end and they may usually end up making little peaks why they make such effective brushes they naturally draw towards each other at the ends so think about that think about the direction how exactly how they're laying something really really subtle here hardly see them but they're there and then you want more so the here now just pressing slightly harder because I want thicker more defined lines Again, I know it looks a bit stuck on but don't panic there is another step to this process Very often people want to start with this sort of texture. It's um, but for this, the hairs are just the last, last thing to add. Yeah, okay, around that way. See, this is where I jump around too much. Finish this bit first. <laughs> and also, because you've done lights of darts, you can just draw little hairs out over the shadows and that will really help it look real and how hairs really are again thinking about highlighted areas curling down fold. sorry get my hand out from under that camera those hairs out over the shadows and this is like I was saying about doing the backgrounds first this is what I like to be able to just, just flick the little bit of hair so my so having control of your pencil pressure is really really valuable don't underestimate those you know it sounds such a basic skill but if you haven't you know I've drawn all my life I've always drawn since I was a child it's just something I've done very naturally but if you haven't you know, to, to me, talk about pencil pressure sounds, it's really obvious. That's what we all do, isn't it? But if you haven't drawn, why would you know that? It's, um, you haven't picked, you know, had people come when I'm teaching, you haven't drawn since they were at school. Literally haven't been in a situation, had the urge to do it. And actually, they're often really good. <laughs> they have amazing, you know, they just literally take it, take, follow instruction to the letter, then haven't got any preconceived ideas and produce some gorgeous work. Um, but yeah we're all at different stages so it's like don't compare your day one or your day three and you're drawing an artistic journey with my day 7000 or whatever it's um comparison is never good anyway you just want to make sure you do the best work you can and that you really enjoy it and someone can remind me of that when I get <laughs> have my down days <laughs> Because it happens to all of us. We never, we always think we can do better and we should be doing better and blah, blah, blah. Do I you only use Faber Castell Polychromus? No. I am for this particular drawing. I think because I'm only using, you know, half a dozen colours. But I will also use Caran d'Ache and um, Dermot Lightfast. I've got some really nice selection of sort of muted purpley greys which are fab for animals because they give it they're not um too unnatural but they just give a really nice feel I just want a little bit of hair flicking up up here but you don't need to buy every pencil range you really don't 
unless you get a bit obsessed and then you will <laughs> So now we're starting to, it's starting to look like fur, but, but those of you who've seen the whole thing, how it's taken me one hour, 20 minutes to get to the point I'm actually putting hair on this drawing. So I think, you know, more you can break down your process into layers and stages, the easier you'll find it. You won't get frustrated. And normally we just get, you know, give up too soon. We have this big ugly stage in the middle where it's, as I've just shared with you this morning, it's really not looking like much. And you could possibly drop in and out and think, what is she doing? Um, by the end of it, have something which looks really nice, hopefully. <laughs> so I'm looking again, like, where are the real... I'm just applying a little bit more on the... Um, really lightest areas so if you're having trouble as well seeing the lights and the darks again because I've worked in graphite it's something I do quite naturally um, a really good thing is to turn your is to basically make your image black and white if you've got a photocopier or have the image on your tablet or smartphone or something you can just take the color out and then you'll really see where all the lightest areas are and where the darkest areas are and that will help let's see how again just a few really really light and I might put a couple more in when I've done the next stage but I'm just gonna pop a little bit more hair around there okay right so then I get a oh, it's popping off again. Back to my burnt ochre. And so I've got now I have got a very sharp point. And this is I'm gonna do a glaze of colour over the top of my ivory um, pencil strokes which will add a little bit of pigment and tone in the ivory into the background a little bit more but still retaining the shape of them so i you have a very sharp point i also hold the pencil if you can see um right at the end so i sort of have it this way so it's reusing the side of it which i will just turn as i go to keep the sharp point sharp and then i'm just gonna lightly using a circular motion see how that's just softly so you know still getting We've still got the shape of those hairs but they're not stuck on top anymore and some areas you can sort of do it at the base but let the hairs get lighter so they really blend into the previous layers and ivory works particularly well for this it just must be something in the pigment and i'm just being careful as i go i'm not just scribbling out over the top then you lose the little bit of paper texture that um, appeared but it just just blends it in really nicely and you might sort of go in at the base a little bit and just take those out they just see how that's blending that hopefully you're getting enough of the detail coming through still there haven't like covered over those hair strokes but they're just a little bit more um, harmonious with the background and there again see how that's happening there you can sort of leave the odd bit ivory pure ivory And this is why I don't need to use blending pencils or anything. It does the, the layering process does naturally start to really blend everything together. When I have tried, you know, the blending stuff in the back, I end up it makes me 
think of it getting a, it's a little bit too waxy you almost get that sort of um, wax crayony type effect you put too much on but that's not to say they can't work in certain situations I think sparingly they're really good but generally if you can just get into the habit of a few more layers you'll normally find you don't need them So then I just evaluate, you know, maybe I might decide that I want a little bit more red in certain areas. So yeah, you can do the same sort of thing with the terracotta. Just blend, this is a tweaky bit. It's going through. You can go back in, um, is it umber or whatever, if you want to put a few dark, put in a few shadows, it might be through here, you just want to darken some of the bits between, just to bring some of the hairs out. And soften it around here a little bit if you've got too much of a hard line. sort of done it's not perfect because it's an exercise rather than um, oh I'm doing something weird with the camera now I'm not yeah these things so you don't have they don't have to be perfect it's it's a way of learning you know learning about you can glaze over the ivory and you know you can do that with any of your cold colors your, your light colours rather like a cold grey one or a warm grey one just to add a little bit of colour and, and tone it all in but still keep that texture and this is you know really useful if you haven't got the, exactly the right colour to go well it doesn't matter because you can mix them <coughs> <Excuse me. coughs> choking ah, that's not good so that pretty much is that for this morning I really hope you've enjoyed it um i really enjoyed it i really i finding i really like doing stuff to videos there'll be lots more don't worry and i'll be adding stuff to my youtube channel as well so pop on over to there and um have a little look i we'll have some stuff that isn't live videos i've just taken of work as i'm going normally so if you want to do that that will be cool um that, so i will i think next what i'll do is i'll sort out some of the um exercises that I like to give people to get them feeling comfortable with pencil pressure and what I mean by pencil pressure and the how to blend and how it all works that way some of the real like basic this is getting going exercises and I'll do a little live hopefully over the weekend if I um organize myself um but I say if you're not around when I do it then it's available on the um Facebook page anyway so there's no problem there fabulous well thank you all for watching it's been really cool and um, i'm going to stop this now i'm going to have a cup of tea <laughs> and i will see you later bye bye <laughs>